What about green? We decided for the 50th anniversary of the Serpentine to actually uh, do a exhibition called Back to Earth. I want to quote here Bruno Latour from Down to Earth, politics uh, in the new regime. When the rug is pulled out from under your feet, you understand at once that you are going to have to be concerned with the flow. So we basically going to invite 50 artists to do 50 campaigns for the environment, uh, to resist extinction, to fight extinction, and we will at the same time, of course, also further work on our general ecology project, which is now embedded in all the aspects, really, of what we do, and we also uh, appointed with Lucia Petro, just the uh, curator of ecology at the same time. So, it's slow? Yes, slow programming means, that's what Ben Wick has always says, I will see you at the same time, the slow programming means, of course, that we go beyond the event horizon. I mean, Fernand Brodel, the historian, talks about la longue durée, about more long duration projects. And I think if you really think about resources and also how to be more responsible with resources or how to use resources in a more responsible way, we need to think not about events, but we need to think about projects on which we work you know, with more time, for more time. And it's something I've always been interested in. In this cafe here, actually, at the Café de Flore, we began the Do It project with Bertrand Labier ah. and Christian Boltowski in, uh, uh, at the very beginning of the 90s. And that exhibition has evolved over almost 30 years now and has always changed, has taken local things into consideration, local research has grown, and is a very slowly growing project which also learns from the context. And I think that idea that one works on something for a very long time is something we need to institutionally learn. And I think an exhibition has, you know, one show after the next, it's kind of events. And I think we need to think how we can go beyond that. And are you able to speak slowly? Yeah, I was always um, actually at the beginning um, uh, when I lived in Switzerland um, told that I would speak so fast. Um, I don't know. Do you think I speak fast now? <laughs> The danger about becoming green. I don't think that there is a danger in general about making ecological. I don't think there is a danger in general about making ecology a key concern, but there is a danger, of course, um, of maybe new forms of localism, and that is, is I think, something uh, where we can really learn from Edouard Glissant. Again, here in this very uh, cafe here, at the Cafe de Flore. I had endless conversations with Edouard Glissant already more than 20 years ago. And Edouard, of course, realized early on the visionary writer, philosopher. He was poet, of course, also from Martinique, who lived the last years of his life in Paris. He, he realized early on that we live in an age of globalization. It's not the first time the world experiences globalization. There, has been, there have been many previous moments of globalization. The Roman Empire would be one example. But Lisa always said, you know, our globalization today is certainly the most extreme, and maybe it's also the most violent form of globalization. And that leads us to the disappearance of many things. It leads us to the disappearance of species. It leads to um, extinction, but it leads also to the disappearance of cultural phenomena. Languages disappear at very fast pace. And uh, this sounds that we need to basically resist, no, this homogenized form of globalization. And but he early on understood that there's going to be a counter-reaction and that the counter-reaction will be anti-globalization, which will lead to new forms of localism, new forms of nationalism, new forms of racism, uh, a disappearance of being open for each other, uh, 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 no longer listening to each other, the idea also of, of a disappearance of curiosity for the other. And he said that needs to be resisted vehemently as well. So we resist, according to Glissant, the homogenized globalization and we have to resist the counter-reaction of localisms. And I mean, Bernard Stiegler says, how can we be local without being localist? And so I think in a way, Glissant showed us the way. He said, mondialité, and it's interesting because the French language has this wonderful word of mondialité. I never was able really to translate it into English. We could maybe say mondiality. And according to Glissant, la mondialité is a global dialogue which is open, uh, basically, for local differences, which is, which is not an imposed globalization, but which is, which is listening. And this quality of listening, I think, is very important, that we listen to each other, that we also listen uh, to plants, that we listen to, to animals, that we listen you know, to, um, to many things. And I think, in a way, the idea of, of mondialité is a way how we can actually negotiate so and avoid the danger you evoke, yeah?
So let's, let's listen green. Where does green come from? So when I organized my first exhibition at the, at the Serpentine Gallery as a guest curator, it was in 90... Keep on, keep on. What is it? Okay, when I organized my first exhibition in uh, 1996 at the Serpentine called Take Me, I'm Yours, the day after the opening, someone came to the lobby desk and said he would like to talk to Hans Ulrich, the curator, and that person was Gustav Metzger. And uh, I, of course, had never met him and we drank coffee together. He never drank coffee, he would only drink actually hot water. Uh, uh, boiling water, and we uh, had a discussion. He told me that in the 1960s, 70s, he had organized very similar initiatives of participatory art down Exhibition Road in the Goethe Institute. And it was the beginning of a friendship which really lasted until Gustav passed away two years ago. And Gustav Metzger, from our very first meeting onwards, basically said that we shouldn't talk about climate change. He said, when we talk about climate change, that's not enough because people will not wake up. And he said, we really need to talk about extinction. And he um, did an exhibition, actually, a retrospective, which we curated with him at the Serpentine uh, of his uh, extraordinary works that included, uh, for example, the flailing trees, where he talks about the dying trees, trees suffering from you know, the climate change and so on. And once the, day, the show was open, the next day, Gustav came to my office and he said, don't believe that it's now done because the fight has just begun. The struggle has just begun. We have to do more. So I said, Gustav, what could we do? He said, you know, you have this farm out of the marathon, which is something um, I've always organized with our teams at the Serpentine. And these marathons are kind of knowledge festivals where we bring together many different disciplines. And I think that's important. I think when we address the big topics of the 21st century, if it's climate change or extinction, or if it's also inequality, which is another uh, major topic of great urgency, um, then we, as like Gustav, we need to basically bring the disciplines together. And that's, of course, what the marathons do. They basically address a topic from all different angles, from all different disciplines. And so Gustav said, we just use this format of the marathon and do it about the theme of extinction. So we did the Extinction Marathon and invited speakers from all different fields to discuss. And again, the next morning after the marathon, Gustav stood in my office and said, don't believe it's done, <laughs> you have to do more, and I want to now do education with you. So I said, absolutely. And so with our education team, we did the Remember Nature Project. And the Remember Nature Project is basically Gustav's uh, project carried into school classes all over England. And um, about a week before he died, Gustav, he was, I think around 90, asked me to come to his house and it was a farewell visit and I was sitting at his bedside and he looked at me and he said, you have to promise, you have to continue. So obviously, you know, we can really say that Gustav is at the origin of what we do at the Serpentine with ecology and that we still learn from Gustav Metzger every day and I think he's one of the most extraordinary artists of the, um, of the 20th century, of the 21st century, and yeah, I remember nature said Gustav, and we could then add remember Gustav Metzger. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. So let's keep on to with green artists. Yeah, I've always thought that um, we can learn from artists, we must learn from artists, and I've, that's what I've always done in conversation with artists, learning from them, um, which is why it's great that these conversations happen here at the Café de Flore, because that's where I had so many conversations with artists, and of course, we can say that um, it's a long list, you know, but I promise, uh, I promise you that this will not be a marathon conversation, so let me be short. Um, yeah, from Gustav, I mean, learning from Gustav, as I mentioned before, but then, of course, it's also learning from uh, Tino Segal, for example, about all his intricate knowledge about, uh, about trains and this idea of of less flying. I mean, Gustav always said reduce art flights, so I committed to um, very strongly reduce my flying and to find other ways of, of moving, find other ways of, of traveling, particularly through trains. At the same time, uh, Ian Chang tells us that it's not only through technology, because there's also um, ecological issues, for example, with emails. And, uh, but Ian Chang, Yeah, because the bigger the inbox is, the more energy is being used. So we need to be careful to reduce these email inboxes and uh, that's another thing, you know, Ian Chang made a whole project around this. The Harrisons are great uh, pioneers of ecological arts and from them we can learn to never ever use plastic. 
because of Gianfranco Barrucello, who the legendary Italian artist, and now stopped eating meat. It's a long list, and uh, interesting also Rose Wiley, the painter, the artist Rose Wiley. She has not bought clothes for many, many, many years or many decades, and she would always repair the clothes and has developed this incredible style really with patches. Uh, so that's another uh, idea we can learn from Rose. And I think it's only the beginning. I think there are many, many more things we can learn from artists. It's almost like a group show, you know? I would say this idea how we can basically improve our lives and uh, is maybe something like a group show. No, but I want you to be more precise. Green for yourself. What will change in your life? So what will change in my life is that I um, reduce uh, very strongly the flights, that I no longer do these many short trips, but I do much less longer trips. It means also that it's a slower way of traveling. Uh, and of course, there is also the reintroduction of the night trains, basically, is very, very important. Because when I started as a, as a student, to basically visit studios and to um, to visit exhibitions all over Europe, I, I would systematically travel by night trains. I had no money for hotels, so I would always sleep or work in the train, come to the next city, see up, go to the next city. And what I've realized over the last years, very sadly, is that um, an important number of these night trains have actually disappeared. You know, you could take a night train from Zurich to Paris, you could take a night train from Zurich to Berlin, you could, when I grew up in Switzerland, you could take a night train to almost any destination in Europe, and many of these um, night trains have disappeared. So I started a movement um, to reintroduce uh, night trains in Europe and hopefully also in the world. Yeah. Um, trying How to did lobby. you? But, uh, what is this movement? Is there a site or what is it? No, the idea is basically for the moment to write to governments and to uh, talk to uh, the railway, uh, the different railway lines that they reintroduce night trains and, you know, hopefully. Um, to have soon a manifesto and, uh, uh, and make it, you know, because I think it's, it's, a, it's a really great way of, uh, of traveling slow and arriving in a different way in a, in a city. I think the other thing is, of course, also that we, we start to think how we can, um, no, we, I think we covered that already with the exhibitions, no? With... But uh, what about meat, for example? You stop eating meat? Yeah, so I stopped eating meat. That's really prompted by seeing Barrucello's work. After seeing Barrucello's work, I can never eat meat again. And of course, again, uh, that's a, an important aspect of living in a more sustainable way. After Green? Yeah, I mean, Jona Friedman just passed away. I want to remember here my friend Jona Friedman. Uh, he was 97, and uh, during the years I lived in Paris between 1993 and 2005, sort of six. So I've lived here for almost 14 years. I saw Jana at least once a month, and uh, I've learned from him so much. Basically, uh, also about sustainability. I think that would be another, uh, you know, example of an artist from whom, from whom we learn. And Jana was always saying that we should think about uh, sustainable cities. That we should think about, you know, cities which would not have a master plan, but which would somehow. Um, we also have an important aspect of self-organization. I've always been thinking how interesting it would be to actually do that and together with artists develop a new sustainable city as a curatorial project. It's one of my many unrealized projects. So next project? Maybe that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the next project is the opening um, in... Uh, the next project is that we are opening actually in three days. On next Tuesday, you should come to London. We're opening the former Phantasma exhibition, and that's the beginning, really, of our ecological um, program in 2020. It's an exhibition curated with Rebecca Lewin. It will happen in, um, uh, it's an exhibition which will happen at the Serpentine with these Italian designers, and uh, this will be um, um, an exhibition about Timbo. And it's uh, former Phantasma Italian designers based in Holland who have an extraordinary practice. They have also looked into the recycling of technological devices, I mean, the incredible toxic waste which is produced through smartphones. They have looked at how we can actually recycle these devices differently. And so that will be an exhibition as a design manifesto because we do at the, at, at the Serpentine architecture, art, design. And so um, we have this exhibition of Fama Fantasma. Soon after, we will uh, have 
um, Counterspace, Bettina Korek and I and our teams are very excited together with David Adre, who is our architectural advisor, the architect, to then present in summer with Counterspace, the so far youngest team of architects, three architects in their late 20s from uh, Cape Town, uh, and they will build a pavilion which is not only fully sustainable, works with sustainable materials, but which will also connect to the different neighborhoods of London. Uh, so it will be not just in Kensington Gardens, but it's a pavilion which will have dialogues with many different parts of London. And that's something which is also very important for us in 2020. We also start our project in um, Barking Dagenham. It's basically a, an education project. Uh, it's at the same time a civic project with our civic curator, Amar Kalaf, and our education team. And uh, we have the artist, Suzanne Lacey, who is in residence with us. You have too many things now. It has only just begun. <laughs> Great to see you. Merci, Green Ons.